Well, a very good afternoon, everybody. Dear President Jacobs, President of the World Academy of Art and Sciences, President Klaus Meinzer of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts, dear ladies and gentlemen, and of course, a warm welcome to our online audience. Today is a historic moment. We have the first meeting ever of both largest associations, European Academy of Sciences and Arts and the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. And the meeting is taking place in Maribor. So we're really happy to have this international audience present. It will be a very dynamic session today. So I hope uh, everybody will stick to the suggested times because we want to be finished in one and a half hours. We have some people present in Maribor and there will also be some people joining us on Zoom online. And now we have the time and possibility to give word to the honorary president of art and sciences, Professor Dr. Ivo Schlaus, who is joining us online from Zagreb. Professor Schlaus, we see you. Do we hear you? Okay. Good afternoon. It is a great pleasure. And thank you very much, Tanya, uh, for these kind words and for putting actually the importance of this meeting at the focus. I'm very proud to be at this meeting and I will convince you in a few minutes why should we all feel proud. Academia, of course, uh, throughout more than 3,000 years has helped societies to minimize threats and maximize successes. And indeed, success is great. The present world is the best ever, and that is quite important. Uh, contemporary, contemporary world is uh, fast changing, global, but still within this global, there are many states and many associations of states, and all of them are interdependent. And consequently, of course, there are national, regional, world academies, and association of academies, like, for instance, ALEA, Interacademy Partnership, and so on. Academies interact widely. First, with scientific disciplines, which is essential. But second, equally essential, is education. And uh, in all of these, uh, actually, they uh, go through and strongly interact uh, with uh, what is called states. And therefore, with politics and economy, and indeed, maybe more than anything else, it is academia which shows that it is essential to change the present paradigm, social, political, and economic. And of course, the World Academy has uh, emphasized that uh, through many years, as a matter of fact, uh, through roughly uh, 20 last years. Uh, let's con concentrate on the threats uh, that the contemporary world faces. The first, or actually the last threat that came, is the threat uh, which is due to new uh, emerging technologies. Of course, as always in history, technologies contain benefits and also threats. And it is our duty to increase the benefits and to decrease the threats. But the development of new economies, of new uh, uh, technologies is inevitable. There is nothing we can do to just prohibit them from developing. New 
technologies are emerging. The second threat is due to the fact that we have largely destroyed our natural and human capital. As a matter of fact, we have a barely 30, possibly 40 years to remedy this damage. And the third threat, which nowadays is particularly dangerous, is war. And the task which before us is stop all wars now and forever. And that is absolutely crucial. And in that process of uh, uh, stopping the war, the World Academy and the Academy of uh, European Academies should actually interact strongly with scientific disciplines, with new technologies, with education. And it is so nice that actually the one of the organizers of this, uh, besides the two academies, is Alma Mater Europea. And this is very, I still remember when I was invited by Alma Mater uh, several years ago to give a talk here. So this, uh, this connection with education, which means uh, with uh, uh, a number of academia and with the association of academia and within World Academy of Art and Science or other stimulated by, we have initiated formation of uh, World University Consortium. It is important to maintain contact with what is called uh, Eisenhower properly called it military industrial complex. And of course, through with any governments. Now, this is one of the first meetings involving three essential of these factors. One, a regional academy, European academy, one, World Academy was World Academy of Art and Science, education, alma mater, and of course, since we all belong to some states, our states are involved, and we hope to bring them to the possibility of stopping all wars immediately. This task is not easy, but this webinar and several other activities that we have and what we will have will obviously help us to formulate how to stop it, how to make it forever. Thank you very much for your attention. Man. Thank you very much, Professor Schlaus, who deserves an applause. Professor Schlaus talked about threats posed by emerging technologies and how the initiative should also support stopping the war, which is in fact the topic of today's dialogue on sustainable future, education, artificial intelligence and peace. And I would like to continue now with the Vice President of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, Donato Kiniger Pasili, who will present the vision statement for a new peace offensive. Uh, dear Professor Meinzer, Professor, <laughs> Professor Toplek, our guest, our host, Gary, of course, Ivo, thank you very much for hosting us here today. And uh, all the distinguished guests that we have online as well, I want to uh, salute them as well. Uh, my task is, as Daniel said, to illustrate our vision our common vision for a new global peace offensive. I'll try to do so. Recognizing the dangers of current wars and the urgency of the moment, the World Academy of Art and Science and 
the European Academy of Science and Art, came together and crafted a vision for a global peace offensive. This initiative, as you will see later on in the official uh, signing, in the official signing of the document itself, aims to identify practical measures to change direction and lessen the intensity of confrontations through a global peace effort, focusing on incremental, reciprocal, reciprocal steps for conflict resolution. It emphasizes cultural, scientific, economic, educational, and environmental diplomacy, alongside political, economic, and media systems. The world we navigate is both multipolar and multi-perspective, requiring a deeper understanding of our environmental surroundings and the world we inhabit. We must understand what drives individuals and groups, including students and future generations. Complex environments do require a vision ahead on how things can be done when the deadlock is resolved, building trust, avoiding dehumanization, double standards, and forgotten conflicts. As complexity grows, it is essential to integrate multidisciplinary perspectives throughout our educational systems, curricula, and evaluations. International cultural awareness should not be seen as barriers or demarcation lines. This is not the time for apologetic outcries or defensive strategy to conceal our own beliefs. Such awareness should be accompanied by deep consciousness of our cultural heritage and history. Arts and science advancements are indispensable for having a forward-looking vision and for transmitting knowledge with a deep sense of humanity, inspired by critical thinking and informed decisions. Throughout our vision statement for a global peace offensive, we have a unique responsibility to work towards trust-building initiatives, assessing the needs and claims of all parties in any given conflict giving a voice to all stakeholders and reinforcing promising international cultural exchanges and collaboration. A vision of human security rooted in peace, human rights, and individual progress acts as the true gatekeeper of our society. Even in the face of deep divides, we need to enhance literacy advance science and ensure that the quality of our studies reflects human aspirations. We must encourage students to learn how to learn, orienting themselves in the labyrinth of information, artificial intelligence products, and the vast galaxy of data. We know that artificial intelligence is a double-edged sword, has a dual role. Undoubtedly, artificial intelligence can enhance intergenerational dialogue and help bridge the gap between developed and developing countries. Artificial intelligence systems can act as multipliers for both war and peace, fostering mutual understanding or dystopian scenarios. They could help predict armed conflicts and their root causes, and also devise optimal interventions to avert major crisis. By analyzing behavioral changes and megatrends, we can avoid spiraling into crisis, optimizing interventions and fostering cross-disciplinary collaboration is crucial for improving intergroup relations. Artificial intelligence is also a tool for peace building and diplomacy, as we know, and can become akin to an autonomous weapon as well, beyond human control, but it could also ease tensions by controlling or resolving existential threats and analyzing vast data sets. Predictive diplomacy and predictive peace building 
uses machine learning nowadays for scenario planning towards achieving peace. Traditional tools of politics and diplomacy are becoming outdated, especially with looming threats emanating from climate change, polarization, forced migration, and extreme violence. Science diplomacy relies on interdisciplinary work that unites political science, mathematics, and, and behavioral science, including branches like computational diplomacy and negotiation engineering. Text mining, as an example, for diplomatic relations is a modern application that can enhance cooperation and improve outcomes of negotiation processes. Our vision statement calls for innovative educational models that combines artificial intelligence and the mobilization of social networks that significantly influence political decisions and global peace dynamics. We aim to identify create and project peace building opportunities, facilitate dialogue between conflicting parties, improve decision making, analysis and narratives through innovation conflict resolution techniques and strategies. We will explore together ways to expand our efforts on a multi-regional scale and attract also human financial and other resources for our mission. A vast field of opportunity exists for prediction and, anticip and anticipation, backed by enormous data sets. Examples are in diplomacy are resolutions, for instance, negotiations, products like statements, reports of the Secretary General of the United Nations, imagine whatsoever. I mean, uh, reports of the Security Council. There is a lot that is part of our key, but data and computational modeling could improve our understanding of how multilateral organizations function and influence diplomatic processes. Although negotiation engineering won't replace face-to-face -face diplomacy, it can help build trust with accurate data and prediction. Media monitoring and analysis is another application where machine learning can anticipate conflict escalation, exemplified by inflammatory speeches, and support informed decision-making. Peace modeling to tackle climate change is another potential application. The issue of fake news is pertinent. Addressing data veracity is a critical research area. Artificial intelligence could assist, <laughs> but also could risk creating distorted data, data leading to an artificial truth. But it's also true that artificial intelligence information can be checked by alternative artificial intelligence systems. So what is the future of science diplomacy? Training science diplomats, building their capacity and evaluating progress will become essential in the near future. Shared interests and goals in science diplomacy are expanding already, with non-state actors increasingly involved in technological progress. Emerging economies are well positioned to use science diplomacy to prevent conflict and inequalities, create new norms, and extend their influence. The soft power of diplomacy can help advance global common interests alongside the hard power of science. Global issues like climate change and pandemic preparedness requires transnational strategies, transnational strategies based on trust building, international exchanges, and collaboration. We hereby invite the academic community, altogether intellectuals and global leaders, to support our common vision, individually and institutionally. So we join forces to build a bright, secure, and peaceful future for all. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of very interesting suggestions. Uh, just perhaps one question. Why this vision and why now? Very good question, Professor Angleitner. Why a vision, first of all, <laughs> and not another uh, statement or declaration? Because the vision we have, that we have nurtured together, is an action-oriented <laughs> program. 
is not uh, just a flagship to to flag something to the public attention. Is a strategy <laughs> in terms of how we can operate. The uh, um, the plan, the reason why we are here today is exactly this: to show the fact that we are committed towards a new way of learning, a new way of teaching, a new sense of solidarity among institutions, and a common objective that is contribute to this peace offensive, turning down, you know, uh, and, and anticipating uh, crisis in many places and de-escalating tensions through common the common exercise that it goes together with the traditional techniques and the innovative techniques offered by artificial intelligence. There will definitely be plenty of opportunities later on to further delve into this subject. Let us now continue with the president of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. Um, since the majority of the present members is from the World Academy, let me just take a brief moment to introduce our speaker. Professor Dr. Klaus Mainzer is a philosopher and scientist, both together. <laughs> And just to say that in the 70s, he wrote his doctorate in philosophy and mathematics together, talking about the fundamentals, about mathematical constructivism. And I'm sure that in his presentation, he will enlighten us about all of these contents and how they fit within the education, artificial intelligence and peace. Professor Mainzer, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction, and uh, it's a, a great uh, a pleasure for me uh, now to uh, introduce this first meeting of uh, the World Academy of Arts and Science and the European Academy of Sciences and Arts, but of course uh, vice versa. And uh, Ludwig uh, asked me to give a, a talk exactly to uh, this uh, a topic here, AI and uh, peace, and uh, the subtitle here is From uh, Foundational Research to European Policy of uh, Democracy. And uh, uh, actually, I will start with a short reminder, uh, breakthroughs of AI, and uh, then we'll come to the topic Peace with uh, Sustainable uh, AI. Now let's start with a short uh, reminder. Uh, what is artificial intelligence? Um, the project as a scientific project uh, started in the beginning of the 50s. It started with a famous uh, uh, paper of Alan Turing, the British uh, uh, mathematician and computer pioneer from 1950. And that is the so-called Turing test. What does the Turing test mean? It means that uh, according and following uh, Turing, um, a system, for example, a machine, should be called intelligent if it cannot be distinguished concerning its answers and its uh, reaction from a human uh, being. And in the beginning of the 50s, uh, people tried to simulate logical thinking because they thought logic, that is in the center of human intelligence. And they were rather successful because they uh, supported what we now call automated proving. That means the system simulates these if-then rules in logic. If this and this is the case, then this and this follow, and so on. And then it was also applied to practice. These are the so-called expert systems. For example, in um, medicine, the idea if you observe some symptoms of a disease, then you have an automated didactic formalism, which is uh, suggesting you the uh, concerning uh, disease. But exactly at that point, the restrictions of this approach become obvious. Uh, in the 60s or 70s, people realized, oh, uh, human intelligence, uh, human experts, they cannot be uh, restricted to logical if-then rules. Uh, human expert in engineering or in uh, medicine, he has some intuition, he has some unconscious abilities, and that cannot be represented textbook-like in if-then uh, rules. And uh, another restriction was in uh, pattern recognition. For example, if you 
um, observe um, photo, a photo consists of millions of pixels. And it makes absolutely no sense to introduce logical rules for each of these uh, pixels. And a single pixel is absolutely uninteresting. Only the statistical distribution is necessary to get an impression of the shape of the figure uh, of a person. And so, um, and that is illustrated here in the picture, uh, in the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, we observe a paradigm shift in uh, AI, namely from the logical oriented algorithms to statistics, to the statistics of big data, to statistical learning theory. And machine learning nowadays is based on statistical learning uh, theory. Of course, if you have these uh, big uh, uh, data-based um, uh, systems, then you get some proof that uh, actually uh, the program is doing what it should do. And that needs logical algorithms. So this uh, old idea uh, comes in again, and the combination of uh, logical algorithms with the statistical learning uh, algorithm is sometimes called hybrid uh, AI. Symbolic AI means a logical uh, oriented AI oriented to symbolic logic and uh, sub-symbolic AI means this kind of machine uh, learning. Now, nowadays, machine learning <clears throat> is mainly uh, orientated to a simplified model of the human brain. And these are the neural networks. The neural networks here in the graph uh, consists of some nodes. The nodes uh, represent uh, the neurons in the brain and the arrows represent uh, the uh, synaptical interactions. And in the graph, they are uh, weighted by numbers. The numbers indicate the intensity of the neurochemical interaction. And then uh, such a node or neuron is said to be excited or to fire if the sum of the uh, weighted inputs of uh, the uh, neighbored uh, here of the neighbored um, uh, neurons uh, is larger than a certain threshold value. And by that you get a stream of signals, a data stream, which is uh, led here through the architecture of the neural network. And these data streams are triggered by so-called learning algorithms. And we distinguish several kinds of uh, learning algorithms. For example, supervised learning means that at first the system is trained by some sample, for example, of a photo, a photo with the statistical distributed pixels. And then the system is by itself able to recognize exactly this trained uh, photo by approximation with a lot of other perceived uh, um, uh, photos of persons that was uh, used uh, by uh, police hunting, for example, criminal uh, persons in many years. Reinforcement learning uh, means that the system is by itself, and that is amazing, it's by itself able to improve its problem-solving strategy by rewards from the outside. Deep learning only uh, relates to the uh, depth of the neural network, and that means uh, the number of layers. It is, uh, by the way, like in the neocortex of the human brain. The human brain is divided into certain layers, like an Italian lasagna, by the way, and uh, that is illustrated here. For example, uh, at the first layer, only colored pixels are distinguished. Then they are connected uh, as edges and corners, then as uh, partial faces, and finally the recognition of the whole faces. And that is in, prin in principle all. That means machine learning, namely recognition of patterns in big data by learning uh, algorithms. Nowadays, these uh, systems are not as simple as I illustrated uh, before, namely uh, ChatGPT since the last year. And with that kind of uh, machine learning, AI um, has arrived in everyday 
uh, world of every uh, one. And these uh, uh, systems uh, consist not only of four or five layers, they consist of hundreds, they consist of thousands of layers. Remember, the brain, uh, five or six or seven layers. And uh, it consists of millions of uh, uh, neurons and uh, billions of these uh, synaptic weights, which I mentioned uh, uh, before. And uh, it is amazing, and for some people nowadays even shocking, that these kind of um, simulating uh, machine learning uh, programs are able even to pass the Turing test at universities. That means to pass uh, examinations and tests, at least uh, with relation to a written uh, text. And uh, some people are shocked by that, but I must say from a mathematical uh, point of view, don't worry, because let us have a short glance in the machine room of such a chatbot. And uh, these are two of these learning algorithms which I mentioned before, namely supervised learning. Supervised learning means at first the system must be trained by a lot of uh, documents. And the second, and that is perhaps the most interesting learning algorithm, the second one is this uh, mentioned reinforcement learning. That means by interaction of the system with you as user, it learns to give better answers. Perhaps you have already these uh, experiences. It is learning and it is self-training by that. But please don't forget, it is a statistical machinery. And uh, from mathematical point of view, only these algorithms are cal calculating expectations, statistical expectation values of possible data. Nothing more. And therefore, I like to call it sometimes a statistical parrot or a stochastic uh, a parrot, but with an amazing efficiency uh, nowadays. Now, another important point is because in the tradition intelligence, we think these are persons and or animals or robots. No, AI mainly nowadays is distributed in an anonymous way and in an unconscious way in infrastructure. We do not see it. And that is illustrated here in the picture. On the left and the right, you find uh, some... Um, uh, already names of some already existing infrastructures. And uh, the perspective for the future will be that these already existing infrastructure will in the future grow together, like here in a metaphorical way, this uh, brain which is spreading all over uh, the world. And these are the already existing catchwords here of infrastructure, for example, smart city. Smart city, not only in Asia and in China, Shenzhen and near to Hong Kong, but uh, also here in Europe, by the way, by the way, not in Germany, but <laughs> in, uh, in the Baltic state. That's very interesting. Or in Ireland and so on. You can observe that there already. And uh, now ecological systems. You can uh, use nowadays these uh, machine learning networks to uh, supervise ecological system. In South Tyrol, in the north of Italy, for example, it is uh, applied. Or smart grids, optimizing energetic networks or industrial in industry. Now that is a typical <laughs> typical application for Germans. And uh, that means the industry, the machines are equipped with sensors in order to communicate with one another, not only man to man or man to machine communication, but machine to machine communication by this kind of signals. And the global, uh, the global networks of the financial world, which cannot be realized nowadays without these uh, uh, rapid uh, uh, algorithms, financial algorithms, health system. That is a, a great challenge, not only AI in uh, surgery specialized, but the infrastructure in the hospital, that must be uh, digitalized. And last but not least, we are living in time of wars. And uh, our defense systems would not be possible nowadays without the support of um, 
um, AI and uh, dig uh, digital uh, equipment. Now, with that in mind, this uh, short uh, breakthroughs from the beginning, Turing and so on, up to applications nowadays, now our topic, peace with sustainable AI. At first, let me uh, remind you, our Earth is a highly complex system. And it was already a highly complex system before humans came in. Uh, here uh, are the typical factors, the climate, water, energy problem, biodiversity. And you see here in the picture, these factors, natural factors, are connected with feedback loops. And that means, in a mathematical sense, this is a highly complex, very sensible system, very sensible to local perturbation. And now human mankind uh, comes in and it becomes unbelievable complex. That is illustrated here. Uh, these uh, natural factors are connected with the population growth, the growth of our uh, industry, our social problems, our, war, our wars, whatsoever. A highly complex system, feedback loops, highly sensible to local perturbation. And sometimes such kind of complex systems are able to damp by itself the perturbation. That means uh, it is able to be what we call resilient. That is like an organism. An organism which is uh, ill can recover itself. And that is the idea of resilience, balance. And, uh, but sometimes the system can become turbulent and chaotic. That is the case of our climate uh, models, which uh, tell us that uh, if you are uh, beyond a certain critical value here, then there is no way back. Then it cannot return in the former, uh, in the former uh, state uh, in principle. And then the system becomes uncontrollable and uh, chaotic. And therefore, my first claim is concerning peace, peace with nature. Peace with nature seems to be metaphorically, but it means keep our planet in balance. That is uh, our great uh, challenge. And that is the condition of all kinds of other pieces. That is illustrated here in these uh, pictures. For example, here, the burning jungle in the region of uh, um, the Amazon in, um, uh, um, in Brazil or in the Mediterranean region in Greece, for example. We have uh, also these uh, problems with uh, a deep impact on uh, our uh, worldwide uh, nutrition uh, situation. And on the other side, the peace with us, peace with people, peace with uh, population. We have these local walls, wars everywhere, everywhere uh, in uh, the world. And typical for the complex system dynamics is the relation between the local and the global effects. And here in war, we have local wars still local wars here in Europe, you know, and uh, in the Near East, but uh, with a great danger to become a global effect, and that means a world war. And uh, so uh, peace with nature and peace with uh, nations is uh, the great challenge, and I think that is would be a real topic for our uh, academies uh, here. And uh, that is already my uh, last slide. How should we realize that? What means a policy? Now, from a European point of view, and you know, uh, with our European Academy, we are also engaged in several activities in the EU concerning these uh, problems. So I think the first task is we have to do our duty, decarbonization peace with Earth. That means renewable uh, energy, alternative fuels, and that is innovation. And by the way, that is the whole strategy behind that. My personal experience is, if people are in struggle yeah, and in conflict, then let them work together in common projects. And common projects means sustainable and responsible mm -hmm. innovation. So 
on the decarbonization task, we can realize sustainable development. For example, in economy, circular economy. Circular economy is exactly, from a formal point of view, is exactly the idea to find a kind of uh, economy which is appropriate to these feedback loops. You remember. Yeah? And that is now realized in an economic way. And that is a highly complex challenge. It can only be done by the support of uh, digital tools. And now AI come in as a useful tool to realize that. And uh, the whole strategy, of course, should aim at what we nowadays call uh, sustainable innovation. Sustainable innovation means very concretely the sustainable development goals, the SDGs of the United Nations must be integrated into our technologies and uh, societal uh, infrastructure. And I think that would be a nice uh, challenge for our both uh, academies and uh, working together for the future. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much also to Professor Mainzer. A lot of points for discussion, for sure. You were talking about the global super brain. So as a mathematician, we go from million, billion, trillion, where, and above or beyond. Where can we go on from the global super brain? Like, what would be the next step in your prediction? Or should we ask ChatGPT for that? Uh, the the next chap uh, the next step uh, would be uh, tomorrow I have another sp uh, speech and I will go a little bit in, in this direction but let me give a, a short hint I uh, mentioned here uh, also in this slide the energy problem and personally I think since my own uh, engagement in this kind of research. Um, the energy problem on this earth with all its sustainable uh, environmental uh, problems is closely connected with digitalization. And uh, in the European Academy, um, uh, Johannes will uh, remember, uh, we had an uh, initiative of white papers, uh, two white papers on the energy problems and on digitalization. And uh, because digitalization means an enormous energy consumption nowadays. It will be the most energy on our Earth in the next year. And that is a problem. So we have to consider alternatives of uh, uh, computational uh, architectures. And I think that will be a future in the next year. And I'm personally engaged in this kind of uh, work. But here, for uh, our discussion here, the point is, don't uh, uh, only consider AI in an isolated way, because the AI tools connect on energy, very physical uh, efforts and demands. And uh, we must uh, consider both together. In the end, the common uh, aim is uh, what I called uh, sustainable innovation. Innovation. Uh, AI is a tool in that uh, initiative. It is not the goal. It is a tool. It can be a useful tool, but of course it can also be dangerous. It must be integrated. All right. So thank you very much. We are looking forward to your address tomorrow morning for everybody who is joining us live for the promotion of uh, the university. We're now continuing with the host of this event, Rector Professor Dr. Ludwig Toplak, Rector of the University Alma Mater Europea. Now, we were challenged already by Vice President Kinniger who talked about the role of multidisciplinary perspective. And Professor Mainzer said something about the connectivity and building bridges, which is exactly what Alma Mater Europea University does. So Professor Toplak, could you enlighten us a little bit on what's going on within the University of Alma Mater Europea on this topic? Thank you. The opportunity, distinguished guests, President Gary Jacobs, President Oyaso, Klaus Meinzer, and all other dear friends. We are very proud and happy uh, organizing this meeting. Alma Mater Europea is a university, but we feel the need 
or broader approach how to solve the real, cha real challenges of the today world. And uh, we see that the world today is faced with uh, turbulences. And the question is how to overcome political, economic, and ecological. Science and art could help a lot, and that's our our right, our privilege, and as well our responsibility. Cooperation between these, these two so eminent representative academic networks like World Academy of Science, Sciences and Arts and uh, European Academy of, of Art and Science and European Academy of Sciences and Arts uh, this cooperation could be very useful and let's start with a new approach and we believe that the vision of a global peace offensive is the beginning for new paradigma or new approach and as well that way we could contribute to the peace so the peace in the society the peace with the nature and as well the peace with between between people individual so we can greet and express peace with you thank you you're now passing on the microphone to a representative from institute josef stefan alexander zidanschek now you'll you'll be talking about artificial intelligence for peace, but with your background in sustainable development and physics, and we were challenged by Professor Mainzer, who said we need to make sure that we preserve nature in order to get peace. What are your reflections on that? Uh, thank you for a very nice uh, starting point. And also, uh, thanks for to all my predecessors for introducing these topics really nice as a physicist you know uh, there are like a few things that physicists have done even before my time so the first was this nuclear bomb uh, which the physicists are responsible for so that's why we also have a moral obligation to resolve the situation which followed because of this nuclear bomb and the second thing that we are talking today the artificial intelligence i mean when i was very young we were like using hopfield model which means also artificial intelligence kind of originates from the spin system that the physicists have been doing so we are kind of doubly uh, responsible for the crisis that we face today and now how to come out of this crisis is of course uh, the, the problem the challenge and this challenge is of course greater today than ever in history but so the opportunities are greater today than ever in history and here i would say on one hand we have these short-term solutions on the other hand we have those long-term solutions so as we know the doomsday clock is at about 90 seconds i think uh, which is the shortest time ever in history even during the cuban crisis it was not as bad as today uh, which means that we kind of need to bring uh, people together and uh, just before a few days ago with gary we actually asked chat gpt what you could do and uh, he gave us a lot of answers i don't know 10 pages i guess but the, one of the most important uh, answers was the same as president mentioned before get people to work together so which means that the chat actually can think similarly as we do so this is like the short-term challenge but the long-term challenges are in my view they are mainly rooted in education education systems and better education all over the world so that people are learning to work together to like each other to okay, at least love each other if they don't like each other uh, and also to come up with solutions because we have like more than 8 billion people everybody can do something useful and we can kind of uh, convince people from the young age to work on solutions and to do something useful uh, then i believe we have obtained a lot of progress towards our direction. So for example, we are using now at, uh, at our school, we are using this AI systems to kind of monitor the competences of a student. We have like a small pilot. We are doing this in two courses this year uh, to figure out what do they know when they come and then try to monitor each lecture, how this competence are improving towards the final destination so that they can do something really useful in their life also in this future of the smart machines so this would be like this long-term approach uh, and of course 
we know that uh, our world is kind of a little bit out of balance, especially with these superpowers, which are kind of uh, step overstepping their boundaries. And in order how to stop that, I believe that these artificial intelligence tools are going to help us. And also as physicists, we're going to develop new tools. I mean, these neural networks were developed like 40, more than 40 years ago. I mean, even 80 years ago, if you look at uh, the first... Uh, the first tries, but these functional neural networks are actually about 15 years old. Maybe, you know, computers are faster, neural networks are better, but in physics, we still have quantum computing. Then we have biological computing, which would like reduce the computing time. So the, the future is actually bright and we just need to step into it. Thank you very much. And this applause is for a bright future. We're now moving back to Zoom with us, Goran Bando from, I think, Zagreb. We heard the point of view of a physicist and sustainable development. Now again, Vice President Kinniger challenged us with something about inadequacy of traditional diplomacy and what could be the role of science diplomacy. And I believe this is a little bit of your background. So peace and diplomacy, what can you tell us about that? Uh, thank you, Tanya. I'm very glad to be here with you. I see in the room so many friends of mine. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, not to say uh, the names. Uh, my dear friends, um, the peace is the topic actually deep in me. Um, as you probably already know, I'm a lawyer and political scientist, but deep in my heart, I'm peace researcher. Um, why peace? Um, long time ago, I was a young guy. I was only 13 and it started a war in my country. It started uh, the war in my city. Um, someone bombarded my city and three months I spent in the basement. After three months spent in basement, I lived my country. Um, I became a refugee child. I was alone. My family uh, stayed back home. And I was alone one year as a refugee child in Germany. And in this refugee child time, um, I made it one decision. And uh, that was probably not something I made it really decision. It was something inside of me. Um, I decided I will do everything was possible to do that anyone else suffer as I suffered my family suffered, my nation suffered. Uh, and that is really um, that what I'm doing through my uh, career. I'm uh, very devoted to topic of peace. Um, and I th think really the peace is the most important topic, uh, not only in my career, it's actually the most important topic in the world. Um, that's, we see that in the moment. Uh, when we are talking about peace, um, I think the most important uh, dimension of peace is peace with us. That's the personal level of peace. Uh, without this level of peace, it is not possible to do any other peace dimension. Um, when we are talking about peace dimensions, uh, we are concentrated today on the global peace. Uh, between the, this personal level and this global level, we have different other levels, like, for example, peace with nature, as Klaus mentioned, already or uh, peace with uh, communities, peace, interstate peace. Uh, but I think really the most important is to have peace with ourselves. Uh, and with this peace with ourselves, we start uh, then to find solutions, uh, probably if it's possible, win-win solutions to any conflict in life. Um, when we are talking about science diplomacy, uh, Tanya, thank you uh, to say that I'm expert in this. Um, I think uh, I know something about science diplomacy. I'm leading science diplomacy committee in the Global Young Academy um, based in Leopoldina in Germany. Um, science diplomacy is really important tool and probably the most important tool in the hands of academies in World Academy. European Academy or each university. That is the most important tool. Uh, it is possible to divide science diplomacy in three aspects. The first aspect is science in diplomacy. 
That means actually science can provide advices to states, to international organizations in specific fields like peace or foreign policy. And we are really experts and they need advices. Uh, this science in diplomacy is really, really important. Uh, the second aspect for me is diplomacy for science. This means actually uh, we can be uh, someone who facilitate international and scientific collaboration. Uh, never forget, scientists can open the doors which the state representatives can't. So for us, it's much easier to open any door in the world for the uh, state representatives. That is not so easy. They need to follow some rules. They need to follow some um, challenges they have already. Uh, and we don't. We can open without any problem. And the third aspect of science uh, diplomacy is science for diplomacy. That can mean actually science co cooperation can improve international relations. And I think that is really very important. And that is the main goal of World Academy. It is main goal of European Academy. And it is a uh, goal of, uh, I will say, for the Global Academy. Uh, for me, the science diplomacy has now the crucial role, especially in the time of conflict, escalation of conflict. And we are living really in very turbulent time, as Ludwig said already, it's very turbulent time in the world. Uh, we, as uh, responsible scientists, we need to do something. And, and we can't forget something that is really important. Peace has no good alternative. Peace has no good alternative. And we need to repeat that all the time. We are responsible to find win-win solution for all actors. And we are responsible for the peace. Thank you. Thank you very much to Goran Bando. Actually, three really, really big challenges for our next speaker, Anna Jerković from the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs. Anna, science in <laughs> diplomacy, diplomacy for science, and science for diplomacy. How would you say about that? My topic is a little broader. Uh, it is uh, related to uh, global governance and this that you mentioned, uh, science, uh, within this global governance, I think it, it is very important and I will, I will briefly show how. And since I represent the social sciences, I will talk uh, how the social sciences and humanities can help us in global governance and steering uh, the humankind uh, to sustainable peace. Uh, so my first uh, point is uh, related to uh, establishing uh, a sustainable uh, global government go governance structure, and that means establishing a world parliament and a world government. Uh, we already have an initiative, uh, uh, which is the UN Parliamentary Assembly, and that is a kind of a world parliament uh, that already ha already has a lot of endorsers, uh, organizations, politicians, members of parliament. Uh, and also scientists endorsing it. Uh, but also I think we need a world government. Uh, and maybe this is also a good place to start talking about it. It is a very complex task, but we can use uh, the example of uh, the European Union, the European Commission and the European Parliament and maybe bring it on a higher level to see how a world parliament and the world government could work for humankind. Uh, my second point would be, we mentioned balance, which which is very important and I always like to mention gender balance and when we look at today's wor world leaders we see that there are a lot that it, it is a male dominated world right now and I would like to see more women uh, as global leaders at least to have a balance uh, and maybe in the future to have also a female uh, dominated uh, world scene I don't say that women leaders are better than male leaders I think that we are equal that we have the same weaknesses and strengths, but uh, just be, uh, the energy is different. The energy is different and maybe women have a different, uh, more sophisticated senses for 
other um, uh, matters uh, within the society. So I would suggest a balance, uh, which was also mentioned before. My third point is establishing a ministry of peace in every country. I think uh, there are all already some uh, countries that have a ministry of peace, but I think that is really important that we have an institution, uh, which is a state institution that is uh, related to peace and coordinating peace activities, uh, and also uh, uh, horizontally communicating with other uh, ministries on joint goals, benchmarks and objectives. Uh, then I would like to emphasize the importance of education, what Alexander says. Uh, I think that uh, peace education should uh, be a part, uh, uh, should be a subject in every school, not only in schools, but also on faculties and in lifelong learning. Peace education is very important. We can call it also citizenship education, but also a deeper education, something that it's related to our emotional intelligence. I think that here also we lack balance because we, uh, we have a highly developed um, rational part of the human being, but the emotional part uh, is underdeveloped and unstable. The psychological part, we are, we are anxious, we, we fear, we have the fear of the unknown, we have the fear of AI, for example. Uh, we have to learn tolerance, we have to learn about virtues, we have to learn about empathy and how to, how to like each other, how to live in the society, so emotional and social skills. Also, I would like to emphasize the importance of media. I think we need the media to spread our messages because uh, the, all the messages of peace that we send from here are usually stay within the academic environment. And we, we can use, this can be a win-win situation, we can use the digital platforms and the media uh, for in-content creation and as a leverage to the general public. I think we need the general public. Uh, also, uh, related to this is peace language. I think that we will hear more about it later, but peace language, rhetorics, peace communication, nonviolent communication, using our words, our, the language is power. Using our words uh, uh, like these terms, peace offensive, like sustainable peace and science diplomacy also. These words to streng that has to strengthen in the, in the public sphere, I think the importance of language and of peace language, we have to put it out there. Uh, also, uh, something that I asked ChatGPT and it gave good answers, uh, it's about creating a new economic model. And that is the one that is sustainable, that is the one that is resilient, and the one that is human-centric and not profit-oriented, a circular economy, of course, but something that has inside a meritocracy, but also equity. And last but not least is more peace campaigns. So. Uh, or organizations that work work together like this, academies working together, faculties, universities, art academies, but also all individuals and NGOs, scientists, artists, literature, media, everyone working together for this peace offensive of ours. Thank you very much. And also an applause for that perspective of the global governance for peace. We are now continuing with contributions for representatives from various fields, because we did hear earlier on that the perspective is multinational, multi-subject oriented. And uh, let's start now with uh, Ioannis Liritsis, who is a member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts and Dean of class number four, Natural Sciences, who will tell us a little bit about how archaeology can contribute to peace. But let's try to stick to the three minutes like before, so we'll be done until half past seven. Archaeology for peace. Thank you. Yes, that is actually the topic that I was given to develop. I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a physicist. <laughs> uh, dear esteemed uh, colleagues, uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, the rector of AMEO and my good friend uh, Ludwig Toplak for inviting me to present this topic. Uh, and I go straight to the point. Uh, I like the last uh, talk because it was practical solutions, implementation, and right to the heart decision makers. But we can discuss, you know, later, of course, about that. So I would like to say a few words about the archaeology, the arts, and not only science. Now we're going to the arts, but specifically speaking, cultural heritage and archaeology, because arts is a wider field. 
the idea that archaeology promotes peace stems from the way it fosters understanding, appreciation, uh, and shared heritage between different cultures and different communities. While this might not always be immediately obvious, archaeology can contribute to peace building uh, in several key ways. First, I would say seven out of many, but the main ones. Shared cultural heritage. Archaeology and cultural heritage uh, uncovers the common threads that link humanity across time and space. By revealing the interconnectedness of past civilizations, it shows how people from different backgrounds have influenced one another over count centuries. This can help to dissolve boundaries that separate communities today, encouraging mutual respect and reducing conflict. For example, archaeological discoveries in the Middle East have shown how ancient civilizations like Mesopotamia and Egypt engaged in trade and cultural exchange, underscoring the long-standing ties between different regions. Understanding these shared roots can foster a sense of unity rather than division. Dialogue and diplomacy. In conflict zones, archaeology can serve as a neutral ground for dialogue and cooperation. Co collaborative archaeological projects between nations or ethnic groups can build relationships that transcend political or ideological divisions. In places where identity and heritage are contested, archaeology can help facilitate dialogue by focusing on the scientific and cultural aspects of the past rather than present-day conflicts. Education and empathy. Archaeology educates people about the diversity and the richness of human cultures, which can foster empathy and tolerance. By understanding the experiences and achievements of different uh, societies, individuals may become more open to respecting cultural differences. Archaeology here shows that civilizations rise, fall, and interact with another, which highlights the importance of cooperation and the futility of conflict in the long run. For example, UNESCO's World Heritage Programme promotes the preservation of archaeological sites as part of a global effort to safeguard cultural diversity. This not only protects uh, valuable sites, but also spreads awareness uh, of shared human heritage, which can combat xenophobia and nationalist extremism. Healing after conflict. In post-conflict settings, archaeology can play a role in reconciliation by helping to reclaim and restore lost or damaged heritage. This process can help communities rebuild their sense of, of identity and pride in their shared history, fostering healing after periods of violence or division. Reclaiming destroyed heritage can help rebuild a sense of continuity and belonging, which is essential for peace. Counteracting cultural distraction. During the wars and conflicts, cultural heritage is often targeted for distraction, either as collateral damage or as a deliberate act of erasing an identity. Archaeology stands against this distraction by preserving and documenting heritage, often risking political and physical danger. Protecting and conserving these sites provides a counter-narrative to the ideologies of division and violence, demonstrating that humanity treasures its shared, treasures its shared past. Uh, groups like the International Committee of the Blue Shield, for example, work in conflict zones to protect cultural heritage and their work is an important form of peace building aiming to preserve not only the physical evidence of the past but also the cultural identity and continuity of affected populations 
Uh, as a conclusion, I could say that while archaeology employing all modern cultural technological tools alone cannot solve conflicts or bring about peace, it plays an important role in fostering understanding, preserving shared heritage, and facilitating dialogue between communities. By highlighting the common humanity of different groups, archaeology promotes a more inclusive and peaceful worldwide and worldview. Studying on a collaborative and interdisciplinary manner our ancestry past, which becomes the most valuable palimpsest, it provides realistic solutions that are a source of inspiration, understanding, peace, because we must learn from our past to continue a progressive, safe pace to the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving from archaeology to nanoscience, Urosh Svelbar from Josef Stefan Institute. How can we contribute to that? Here's the microphone. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, you know, um, nanotechnology itself is a challenge, uh, and everyone could ask uh, himself or herself. Uh, I mean, why nanotechnology, and how nanotechnology on the other side could actually contribute to peace? Uh, I think, as Professor Mainzer said, uh, we need facilit uh, facilitating tools, and I believe that nanotechnology is one of those facilitating tools. You know, on one side, we can use it very well um, as a resource uh, for efficiency and environmental sustainability, like, you know, making good things uh, like water desalination very quickly in the areas where it's not possible. We can actually harvest sustainable energy. The development of P PVs uh, and photovoltaics, it's a significant uh, sign how this can actually progress so we get more energy, more sustainable energy out. And at the end, you know, um, it's also uh, a good source for pollution control as well as uh, remediation. But we cannot forget on the other side, it also contributes uh, to improving global health of populations. So we can use it you know, uh, to, to disease treatment, to diagnose more precisely, more, more quickly. Uh, and so the medical treatments are done uh, properly in, in very short periods of times. Uh, on, then on the third thought, we can uh, think of reducing the scarcity and inequality. Uh, here we are talking about the food. So nanotechnologies can contribute in different cases to the improved food security, as well as, you know, on the other side, uh, source to um, energy, which we actually need for all the, the, the beneficial uh, parts of like artificial intelligence. Uh, here we cannot also forget non-lethal defense as well as uh, peace uh, keeping technologies, uh, cybersecurity and preventing technological uh, escalations, uh, especially during, uh, through the quantum computing, uh, quantum encryption, etc. And at the end, this kind of a technologies could produce uh, new jobs and, uh, you know, uh, technological diversity within the, the case, as well as at the end, mitigate climate changes very efficiently, because it has been proven that on small scale, we can more efficiently capture uh, CO2 emissions and then make a closed loop where we can hold all those gases which we are actually using, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, emitting, basically, we can use them for something what is beneficial, so we can actually do from waste, uh, so waste can be a resource as well. Of course, at the end, we should not forget about the dark side of nanotechnologies, as uh, Professor Zidanchik mentioned in the beginning. Nano, when, you know, during this, the wars, when the uh, nuclear energy uh, and nuclear bombs were developed, they were actually looking for a peaceful tool uh, you know, to develop, uh, you know, to progress the science. So here we should not forget about dark scenarios which nanotechnologies could bring at the end. You know, we have been seeing this in the movies like uh, nanorobots attacking, targeting people, etc. So we should be always uh, diligent and smart in the way that we should handle nanotechnology as well as we can handle AI uh, and regulate it and, and seek sustainable use of it. Thank you very much. Ilirizzi said something like language is power. 
So we are now moving to the power of lexicography for peace. Damir Boras, Rector Emeritus of the University of Zagreb, your contribution to that one. Thank you very much. Or if you can hear me, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I will shortly start with the meaning of lexicography. It is uh, art or practice. I would say also the science of how to compile knowledge databases. And uh, these databases, the databases uh, are not uh, something new because it's lexicography, historically, le lexicography span, spans for 5,000 years from cuneiform tablets to, to papyrus lex uh, dictionaries and also now in digital form of dictionaries, encyclopedias, uh, text corpora, and so on. So uh, how it affects peace? It affects peace just by having in their text knowledge about our history, about our societies. But the problem is that, that uh, that the term history has two meanings. One is a spectral, private. I see some facts of history in one way. The opposite side, victories and defeats are always the same in a factual uh, uh, sense, but they are different for different nations and so on. So it should be very careful when you collect, compile those databases. And it is important to stick to several principles. Uh, when I was elected for the first time for as a rector, I, I in my, how to say, uh, first speech, I uh, stress that we should uh, reintroduce to our societies uh, biblical values. That means some values which will respect all other people, not only us. And that is forgotten in our society. And it is, uh, for, of course, I learned, I, I worked not only as a rector, but also as a dean of faculty of humanities and social sciences. And I established their uh, department for information and communication sciences and also chair for lexicography and artificial intelligence. And I worked also as a vice director uh, for information sciences at the lexicographic institute Miroslav Krveža of Croatia, which was a very renowned institute, who produced so-called maritime encyclopedia so good, of so good quality that Encyclopedia Britannica uh, 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 wanted to uh, uh, try to buy the data, but of course in communist system it was not so, <laughs> let's say, uh, accepted. And uh, of course, uh, these principles uh, means in fact uh, development of democracy. And in the same vein, when you have de democracy, uh, you can see and uh, and and hear and uh, obey different aspects of knowledge databases. That is most important. In many encyclopedias, although they are very good, there are many political aspects very subtly subtly uh, uh, involved in 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 data. For example, in Encyclopedia Britannica, they don't argue about differences uh, among uh, northern uh, languages like Danish, uh, like uh, Norwegian, like, like Swedish, because they were 120 years ago one language. But they still claim there is no different Croatian language, different Serb language, although they are very similar, but not the same. That is political difference. And what is most important to, 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 to have? To have uh, clearly revealed all these different aspects of different people in articles of these da knowledge databases. And that is not always the case. But 
artificial intelligence like ChatGPT could easily compile texts to reveal all those differences and different aspects. When you have different aspects, you can decide by, by yourself what can be true or what cannot be and how you can approach, for example, to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, questions, which is clearly not lightly resolved uh, by, by just looking at data. And this is most important. So artificial intelligence should be introduced to compile lexicographic databases, but whatever sort they are, and uh, not avoid different approaches. Only in that way we can be, let's say, society or world society who can resolve those problems and approach these prob problems in the right way. So that means unbiased, politically unbiased, uh, 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 personally unbiased, uh, culturally unbiased, um, uh, uh, unbiased uh, from the points of view of different uh, groups in the society, like gays, Me Too, the, let's say movements, and so on. And ChatGPT is very good tool, just the tool, as Professor Meitner said. But it will it can be used carefully with good, how to say, task given to them to compile those databases in a that unbiased way. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have just received a suggestion how the global super brain could be improved. But well, we're staying with the language is power and we'll move into the graphic engineering or graphic language as power for peace. Marin Milkovic, Rector of University North. Your thoughts about that? Uh, thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. I have try to, to prepare myself for, for this just, uh, uh, I would say, short speech. What can I say about graphic arts and technology and, and peace? So, because comparing to ChatGTP, it's something opposite. It's something retro from the past. But uh, the idea of graphic technology in the past was spreading of the, of the words, spreading of the knowledge. Uh, the idea of multiplying the texts from the past and learning of the people from the from the Gutenberg time until the now and in, and before it, from the manuscripts was uh, was uh, something altruistic uh, idea uh, to become better uh, person to know more and now we cannot we cannot uh, uh, approach to the graphic technology like just this is the printing industry from the past who is dying you know the the newspapers are printed in uh, lower and lower quantities because we have digital information but uh definitely when we when we speak about uh, uh, graphic technology and what it means in the past one one of our very famous writers from Croatia said that the the box of of the in the that time uh wooden letters was stronger than 1000 rifles maybe this is not the case now it was in the past but definitely what we should think now in the in these new times it's that uh spreading also the false uh, and not true uh, uh uh ideas or thoughts or war thoughts through the printing medias is not correct when you have something online, you can double check it from 100 sources. But if you have something printed in front of you, this is all what you get, especially if you don't have internet in that moment, especially in some, uh, in some uh, uh, rural areas, even maybe electricity. So uh, even when we, when, we, when we see and look about agendas and goals of European Commission, uh, how to stop disinformation and, and fall, false uh, uh, 
uh, uh, false ideas and maybe uh, ideas who are uh, propagating the, the, the war efforts. Um, maybe, I'm hoping, never in, in the future will be case that uh, the printing history in the, in the future will be completely different from the true. Maybe it will be, I don't know uh, what graphic industry or graphic technology can do. It cannot do so much because now everything that is produced and printed, there is also online version for checking or double checking. But the uh, idea from the beginning, from the past, was to produce honest and true information. And this is, I'm, I believe, the most beneficial for, for the piece. Uh, how to, to find uh, uh, right information. Uh, and I believe that it, it will be also the goal in the, in the future for the digitalized graphic technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one last person zooming in from Romania, I believe. Eden Mamut from the University of Constanta. We can see you. Let's see if we can hear you as well. Hello. It's can you hear me? Seaside Black Sea Applications. Hello. We can hear you as well. The floor is yours. Thank you. I would like to congratulate uh, the organizers for uh, this uh, very interesting uh, debate with the uh, unbelievable, uh, let's say, uh, nice and uh, very um, challenging uh, ideas uh, that are uh, uh, now from the perspective of the prestigious academicians and uh, scholars uh, in the service of, uh, of peace. So uh, you know very well that uh, now the Black Sea, we could say, is practically in fire because on a daily basis, uh, even uh, passing sometimes from Romania, we are um, following drones and uh, bombs uh, very close to us from Ismail on the Danube Delta to uh, uh, Kiev and uh, different other uh, geographies, but uh, also there are, uh, uh, let's say, the so-called unseen wars, like uh, it was the election process that was uh, yesterday in uh, Kishinev, Moldavia, which uh, is also an open uh, field for uh, different types of, uh, of battles. So, uh, in this uh, context, uh, I would like to express uh, my deep uh, gratitude to the uh, Executive President of uh, World Academy of Art and Science, uh, Gary Jacobs, for the support that uh, he took in the partnership uh, with, the, with the Black Sea Universities Network. We uh, are... Uh, very active for almost uh, one year to uh, uh, develop uh, different type of activities. We uh, had a special debate on uh, the use of artificial intelligence in, uh, uh, let's say, the service of peace building in the Black Sea region. And uh, of course, uh, uh, among the ideas that uh, have been also discussed here, the first very basic idea is the following. First thing first, to not make something worse, to make something that could worsen the situation. So uh, artificial intelligence is a powerful tool. And uh, we see that uh, actually the very initial users of artificial intelligence are uh, the warfare uh, manufacturers and uh, there they are used in uh, different types of battlefield uh, operations and uh, from that uh, perspective i think uh, the major uh, contribution of of the scholars is how to minimize this kind of um, uh, let's say very uh, bad and deadly involvement of artificial intelligence in uh, this kind of uh, conflicts. 
The second aspect is, of course, uh, to support uh, the science diplomacy, the cultural diplomacy or the soft diplomacy by uh, providing very uh, reliable and uh, very valuable uh, scientific evidence base for decision makers. And uh, from that perspective, we could say that uh, uh, there are outstanding contributions and many ideas have been already presented by the previous uh, speakers. And uh, finally, I uh, would like to mention that uh, we have to identify using this kind of strong tools, those aspects that are uniting us, that are bringing us together to the same table and uh, is offering the background for uh, negotiations, for getting to know each other positions and for facilitating the, the partnerships. So uh, from that perspective, uh, we are also uh, collaborating uh, with the different other institutions and mainly I uh, would like to say also the support that uh, that uh, was is uh, giving to the BSUN. Recently, we had also a meeting at the United uh, Nations event dedicated to the uh, Summit for the Future. And uh, we have several other initiatives related to the United Nations University and uh, their activities on peace. And uh, let's hope that also with uh, the support of the institutions that have been involved today, we shall be able to find a pace for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much to Romania. President Jacobs, after having listened to one and a half hours of thoughts, recommendations, and ideas, what is your now conclusion about this comprehensive approach to peace diplomacy? First of all, I want to thank the first of the time to Professor for taking the to make this meeting possible. And I'd like to thank all of those who have participated and contributed uh, because I think you've done a wonderful job of illustrating some of the essential dimensions of what we have in mind when we talk about a peace offensive. Uh, and I'd like to, my objective would be to answer a couple of questions uh, about the overall purpose and why we think not only this is necessary, I think we all understand the seriousness of the issues, which Ivo Schloss outlined very briefly in the beginning, but why we think that this can make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, just for background, for those who are not acquainted with the work of the World Academy, very briefly, we were founded by eminent intellectuals and many scientists and many physicists uh, concerned with the result of the impact of science when we developed the nuclear e energy and nuclear weapons 75 years ago. Uh, and that taught us that we that, it, that science has a responsibility, that academia has a responsibility for addressing the issues that have been created by the creative works. Uh, and that's our origin. We've spent the last 65 years trying to understand better why the, the strategies up until now have not more fully been more fully successful. We still have nuclear weapons and nuclear threats and even accelerated uh, threats of nuclear weapons today than before, and what we need to do differently. And to abridge it very much, I'd like to say that this initiative is an effort to draw a synthesis of the insights and lessons we have drawn about what is necessary. And the presentations we've heard are a good illustration of the type of approach that we think is necessary. Uh, it's clear that traditional diplomacy by itself, it has not and will not by itself be sufficient to solve the problems we face. In fact, in some sense today, with all of the technology, with all of the prosperity, with all of the knowledge we have, the threats today and the sense of insecurity today are greater than they have been probably since 
uh, in the last 75 years. And we have to ponder and ask ourselves, how is it when we're doing so many things that we think are important for our progress, actually it be can be creating a greater sense of insecurity and threats? And I think our answers, the answers we've discussed today are indicative of the type of solutions we need. We clearly need approaches that are not just local. We're not trying to just settle one dispute between two countries internally or uh, in, in a region. We have to look at the global issues as a whole. And a, and a peace offensive has to have as its, as its measure what we can do at the global level. Not necessarily or entirely, certainly, through global institutions. Our global institutions today are not yet mature enough, not yet empowered enough, as Anna said, to really deliver the force we need. But our scope should be greater. We shouldn't be relying either on the, the multilateral institutions or even the political leadership of countries alone, though they are certainly very important. This is too big a problem to be solved by diplomats or on their own, or by institutions or political leaders on their own, this is something the whole humanity has to participate in. And when we talk about a peace offensive, we're talking about a global social movement in which all partners, all stakeholders, all sectors, we're working with the business community, high technology companies, uh, national uh, science academies, universities, parliamentarians, uh, international organizations of, parl of 180 parliaments of the world, religious organization. This is too big and too important to say it's the responsibility of somebody. It's all our responsibility. And I think what we illustrated today by the very interesting, insightful, uh, brief presentations of our speakers is to illustrate every discipline, every field of activity has a relevant contribution to make, and we none of us should sit back and wait for somebody else to solve these problems. Even the archaeology, it was a very resourceful <laughs> analysis, that even archaeology has a very important role to play. We need all to be part of this, and that's what we mean by the peace offensive. We're optimistic. We're not underestimating the challenges. We'd be very naive to do that. We know we're facing unprecedented challenges because the speed of global social evolution is unprecedented. It's never been this fast. It's never been this complex. We've never had all the people of the world being influenced by each other in such complex, intensive ways. We've never been seeing our technology develop so quickly. All of these things together. So we need a new strategy. We need an integrated strategy. As some of you have mentioned, what we call a transdisciplinary strategy. This is not the purview of a, a, any specialized group. We all have to contribute. And we have to understand the relationship between all the work of each of the disciplines, the impact of food on stability, the impact of refugees, the impact of climate change, the impact of our economies and our financial systems, all of them have a contribution to make. We can't pick, take leave them, any of them out. So we need a multidisciplinary, a multi-stakeholder, a multi-sector, a multi... Uh, we need to recognize the urgency, we have no time for moralizing and no time for pointing the fig fingers. As uh, one of our speakers mentioned, it has to be a value-based approach. We are not here to indict and condemn and say somebody's responsible for all our problems, and if only we get them, we've solved them. Humanity is responsible. Our economy is responsible. Our science is responsible. Our governments are responsible. Our financial systems are responsible. Our educational systems are responsible. We all need to come forward and see what we can do to contribute to being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And, uh, and I think that's the spirit in, in which we've come. What we wanted to accomplish, and I'm really pleased by the efforts and contributions of all of you uh, in it, is to put this forward as an invitation. 
we as an academy, ISA as an academy, uh, alma mater as a, a, a university with a vision, many, many of you may not know what I only learned recently, that 50 years ago to the day, tomorrow, this, uh, our uh, Professor Toplak envisioned a university of peace and development. Uh, and now we're coming together. We didn't plan it that way for the dates. <laughs> we're coming today, together today to say we need an institution whose goal is the peace and development of all humanity. And we hope that this, this moment and this initiative and what we call this vision of peace offensive will be a, an invitation to stakeholders from all sectors of society to come forward and join us in a movement that really has the power to change things. In, we know the, the challenges of, that come from any technology. We've heard about some of the tremendous prospects from it. I believe in the depth of my heart, we have the capacity to make this work. We have the resources and the knowledge to make it work, but we can't do it in a fragmented way. We can't do it by trying to find who's the culprit is causing all our problems. We have to all step forward the way our fellows did when they founded it and say, we are responsible and we're going to come forward. And the we is not just scientists, it's educators, it's bankers, it's business leaders, it's, it's the diplomats from every type, it's religious leaders, it's all. If we do that, this intensity, the difficulty, the un unprecedented challenges and threats we face can give us the power and the motivation to do what we haven't done before, is to break out of our conservatism or our tradition and do what really needs to be done. And that is to reinvent our institutions uh, and work together globally to make it happen. So I have the, the privilege and responsibility to say we would like to close this meeting by formally signing and promoting and offering up to all of those who are participating in this meeting, as well as all other institutions uh, from different sectors, uh, to join us in a, 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 a commitment, a, a commitment we're not uh, just saying we need uh, uh, to bring peace. We're talking about commitment, the strategy that's defined in the original paper, which Donato published in our journal Cadmus, which saying we're looking at incremental initiatives that can be taken at hundreds or thousands of points unilateral initiatives where we're not waiting. If somebody else will do something, then we will do it. We can do it from our side, and it can reduce the tensions. It can reduce the suspicions. It can build the trust. We're looking at, let us each do what we can do and generate that positive momentum that evokes reciprocal responses. Our measure of success will be when we take an initiative, it evokes a reciprocal response from somebody else. And that's the heart of what we mean by the peace offensive. So, Professor, could I invite you to, to sign the declaration? I think you're okay. And this will be distributed uh, and made a public. And we hope that uh, Professor Toplak and, uh, and uh, Alma Mater U Europa University will be the first to join us in this because you have been so instrumental, you have been the catalyst for making it happen and set a stage for all those who are present and participating and all those who this reaches out that you will join us too. Thank you. President Mainzer, after having heard all of that, perhaps just some feedback to the situation, to the suggestions and recommendations? In some sense, it was uh, overwhelming for me. Uh, and it started uh, this afternoon when we met for the first time. And after some comments, I thought, there is someone who is thinking in your way 
and I hope it was uh, vice versa, uh, because uh, we uh, discussed about the uh, or of the beginning ideas of your World uh, Academy, and uh, it was so uh, similar to my uh, youth uh, experience in the academic life. You s spoke about Albert Einstein and Russell, and uh, I was so impressed because these were my heroes, as for several people, of course. And uh, now to learn that we, the European Academy and the World Academy, are so close, even personally, in our ideas, that was very overwhelming uh, for me and uh, a very important personal experience. And I think we will cooperate and go on in this way. Thank you.